Hello, everybody. Thanks for viewing again for the Journeys with Jeff. I'm your host, Jeff. And as always, we've got some really, really fascinating people uh, who are uh, telling us about their journey. And today's guest is no exception. Um, Dr. Eric D'Amato, born in Hartford, uh, and uh, moved to Glastonbury, uh, became a football star and a wrestling star. Uh, football wrestling scholarship to Wagner College in New York City. Um, went to Life University in Georgia, became a doctor in chiropractic. Um, he'll probably help me pronounce that word because <laughs> I'm, I'm horrible at it. Uh, he played uh, team rugby. Um, he came back to Connecticut and uh, opened up a, uh, a very thriving business in uh, Newington, the D'Amato Chiropractic Center. Uh, in, in 04 and um, so we're gonna just talk to Eric and welcome him to the show and Eric Jeff for being with us. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Hartford, Connecticut. Yes, sir. And uh, you when did you move to uh, Glastonbury? I moved when I was 10 so I have three younger brothers so my mother wanted to move us to uh, Glastonbury for the school system. She was working there as a dental hygienist which she still does. What do you remember about the transition? Do you remember Hartford to Glastonbury? It's kind of a... Yeah, I mean, I thought it was actually a fairly tough transition to just move in at, at that age to, uh, to a new school. It took me a little while to kind of get acclimated to the, the school system and to the new people, the new neighborhood. I remember being a little happy-go-lucky kid in Hartford, and then Glastonbury was a little bit of a, of a change of pace for me to, to first get there. Right, 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 but you finally... You get yeah. like what well, kids do, you adjust and... Yeah, I grew up in with a lot of different kids, so after a while you kind of pick and choose who you're, who you're friendly with and who yeah. you kind of get along with. And I think sports was a big uh, big reason I got kind of acclimated to Glastonbury as well. That was one of the biggest things that kind of got me into the, you know, the mainstream with all the different kids there and, uh, you know... Well, by the time you got to Glastonbury High School, you were... Uh, quite, you had become quite involved in sports and very... What is it, what do you suppose it is that got you inclined, do you think you had some inherent athletic tendencies that you were born with or? Oh sure, uh, I mean it was, I always liked sports as a kid growing up, I was always a heavier kid, so at that time even like youth football, which I always wanted to play, it was always a weight limit, I could never make the weight limit, I was running and trying to lose weight and I couldn't make the weight limit. So I couldn't play really until freshman year in high school. And well, I just, wait a minute, a weight limit for football? Yeah, there was a max of weight. You couldn't be, well, I don't remember the numbers, 120 pounds, at 11-year-old or 12-year-old or whatever it was. Well, so I, had a, I was never under that weight limit. And they've changed that, I think, now. Well, when but, you got to high school, what position did you play? I, I just started learning the game, so I started playing defensive tackle, defensive end. And it you know, came kind of natural to me, so I liked uh, you know, the tackling and the blocking and all that stuff. And what, what were your, what were you, when you were, let's say, by the time your senior year, what did you weigh in at? Uh, well, it's funny. So my freshman year, I weighed in like a 205. Big and then, boy. Yeah. Wow. And then I started wrestling only because my grandfather told me that you should wrestle just because you'll get in shape for football. I had zero interest in wrestling other than I thought it would get me in shape. So I, my senior year, I went in like 180 pounds. So I actually got taller and more muscular, but I lost you know 20 pounds in those four years. But you got to the point... It seemed, but you it, you got a scholarship to Wagner mm -hmm. College in football and in wrestling, yeah, rest so you must have distinguished yourself. Oh sure, wrestling a, wrestling I liked a lot once I got into it. Once I figured out how to how to do the moves, and I had a coach that was great because he would just teach me a move and I would do it. He said you were the best pupil because whatever I showed you, you would just go do it. You know, as opposed to you know yeah. being uh, you know stubborn about it, I would just be a good uh, pupil learn the move, go do it, and win the match. So well, I had a pretty good career there. How did things go at? Um, you got a scholarship. You were to Wagner. Mm -hmm. You were yep. so you were you know you were no just middle of the road. You were a pretty much a standout. Yeah, I, I played pretty well. I was captain for football as well as wrestling for my senior year at Glastonbury High. And how did it go at Wagner? How did it went pretty well? Yeah, well, go there? the uh, my wrestling team was. Um, was Division One, so we wrestled some really tough competition, and we had a tough few years there. We didn't have a lot of wrestlers on our team, so we had a, a lot of matches that we really couldn't win because of a four, couple forfeits that we had. We wrestled some big time programs: Penn State, uh, went to Buffalo and Albany, and we went to a lot of different schools: BC, BU. So we had some uh, some I had some tough matches for sure. Wow! Yeah. Wow! And did you did you 
have a pretty good... My career, I was about 50%. I won about half my matches in there, which I think okay. is a success for, yeah, for wow. the model competition we went against. Some pretty big programs. I'll bet you. I had one wow. guy wrestle for BU that went to national championship that year. I wrestled him at 190 pounds, and he went to national championship at 167 pounds. He was huge at 190. I don't know how he got so light, but he ended up taking like fourth in the nation that year. So I definitely uh, saw some pretty top competitors. Wow. Well... What you you graduate? You were an undergrad. You graduated mm -hmm. with a degree in uh, biology. So biology. Yeah, bachelor's in science in biology. So you go from Wagner College with a degree in biology, mm -hmm. and you went to Life University to study chiropractic. Correct. Why? Uh, why did you decide to get into chiropractic? Uh, it's a great question. My uh, my sports experience really got me into chiropractic. I was uh, first wrestling probably, I think I was like 14 years old as a sophomore. And I got in a match and I got my back got hurt pretty bad in, in a, a specific move that the guy did. This uh, is at Glastonbury High School? Glastonbury High School, yeah. I was still a sophomore in high school. Okay. So I ended up going to the chiropractor at that time. My mother's friend's son, about my same age, was going to a chiropractor. They said you should go to get your back fixed and I had no idea, no idea about what chiropractic was and just of course went. Uh, I saw Guy Carbone in Hartford, really liked him, liked what he did to help me feel better. And I used chiropractic all through my high school sports career for football and wrestling, you know, bumps and bruises and kind of injuries and always helped. Um, in fact, I got very close with Guy. So my senior year, I was in the state wrestling championship and it was at my high school, which is you know, not always the case. It kind of rotates around the state. And I invited Guy to come be there and watch me wrestle, which he, he did. He came. And in one of the first or second matches I had, I separated my shoulder. In a, it was a legal move that the guy did, but I ended up having my shoulder pop out and I was in a lot of pain and I couldn't finish that match. So that guy won and went on and I was in the, what they call the wrestle backs, the consolation matches to try to get ahead to ultimately place and then you can go on to the next level. And I didn't think I could finish any of the matches because I was in so much pain sitting on the, the trainer's table. And I remember being really upset. And, you know, I don't know if I was actually crying, but it was that same feeling of really being like, this is it. This is the end of my, my career. And Guy Carpone came out of the stands, found me in the trainer's table, did what I can only describe as like a Mr. Miyagi kind of move to my shoulder at that time. I didn't know what he was doing, but I, you know, felt better instantly. I had a few hours to go home and like lay down and rest and ice it. And I came back and I won my next three matches. Wow. And I won them convincingly too. And I was able to go on to the New England Championships like the next weekend or two weekends later. So and your shoulder held up. It held up. It wasn't Just perfect. What but did. Yeah, yeah, he put it back in place in a way I could actually use it for the rest of that, that day. Well, so I knew at that point that this, this is what I'm going to do someday. I'm going to be a chiropractor as well. Wow! What a wow! What a powerful experience. Yeah, it was very. My friends even said, "What do you? What did he do?" I go, "I don't know, but I'm going to do that." Well, so you go to Life University. That's mm -hmm. where is that? It's in Georgia. It's in Marietta, Georgia, just uh, north of um, of Atlanta. So yeah. it's definitely in a, it was a hotbed of activity. It was a nice city to be around. I looked at two of my top choices. One was was Life University in Marietta. The other one was in upstate New York in Seneca Falls. Also a good school. But it was cold and dark and snowy, and then the other one was was Atlanta. I said, oh, I think I'll choose Atlanta. Well, I so, went to University of Georgia. So you know, I was in yeah, Athens, so you I know. know. Yeah. Uh, been to Atlanta and Marietta, mm -hmm. uh, Stone Mountain. Is it oh Stone yeah, Mountain? yeah, yeah. You know, that's in Decatur, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So you were, so you 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 went through that. Yeah, it was four years of school there. And how, at what point you got in? I, I mentioned uh, you, that you. Football and wrestling, mm -hmm. and then you start playing rugby? Yeah, it was the only thing they had that was close, I thought, to what I played. So I decided I was just going to talk to the football coach, I'm sorry, the rugby coach at Life University. And their program was really good at the time, and they still are. I didn't they had know. a rugby team there? Yeah, and they, they go to some Super League championship all the time. And they have guys from, from Europe, guys from South Africa. I didn't know. I just went and talked to the coach, said, I'm going to play here. And he said, you're not going to play here. <laughs> you have no experience. Go to a club team, he recommended, that learn the game, then come back and talk to me. So I went and did that and played for a, a club team. It was, it was a lot of fun, but a very different game from football. Very different. Well, how would you, matching up, uh, you, you, you've, you've banged around with the rugby. Mm -hmm. You've banged around with the football. Which do you, which do you think is, which is more, I don't know, uh, which is 
more intense, which is tougher. I think rugby was tougher because a lot more, it was nonstop action. And in, in football, as you know, there's a play, then there's a break, and there's another play, and there's a break. With rugby, it just, it just goes. It's more similar to soccer where there's just really not a stoppage of play. If you make a tackle, the ball goes right back to the team. You have to go make another tackle and make another tackle, and the ball turns over to you. Now you're on offense. You've got to run and try to score or pass. It's a very active, very exhausting game. And there's no, there's not the kind of, uh, padding. What, what, what do rugby players There's wear really no padding. There's optional. No, not much there's protection. optional helmets you can wear. Some guys wrap their ears, but it's much more of a finesse game. There's a lot more when you make a tackle of twisting the hips to the ground and and bring them down with a little more, little more finesse than than the real big hits you see in in American football. It's a different game. Well, what goes on? I've never been able to figure it out. I've I've watched some rugby, mm -hmm. not a lot, but I've watched mm -hmm. some, and I I, I, I know that they, 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 there's a point there's a point where these both teams, they call it a scrum. Correct, yeah. Where all the, both teams are in this, like, mm -hmm. this huge huddle. Yeah. What the heck goes on it's in a, a scrum? It's a lot of pushing and shoving. It's a lot of control of the, what they call almost the line of scrimmage in football. You want to try to control where the, 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 the push, you want to get more push, because the ball gets put in by your feet, where the, by the ref. Yeah. And if you push the pile that way, the ball goes to your guys. If you're pushed backwards, the ball goes to those guys. So it's kind of a, a jump ball concept in basketball. But they roll underneath the pile, and everyone's kicking the ball back, and the guys on the outside will pick it up, and then they can start running with it. Now, if the, inside the scrum where the referees can't, is there any dirty Well, there's definitely quite a few. Dirty, quite a dirty few little, stuff? Yeah, a lot of eye gouging and really? ear, ear twisting, and there's a lot of stuff goes on in there. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, how do you, so how do you, how do you score in, in rugby? Do you, do you score a touchdown? Yeah, or? it's very similar. It's a called a try, but it's very similar to a touchdown. The only difference really is when you cross that end zone line, you have to put the ball physically on the ground. If you don't put it down, it's not a, it doesn't count. If you just run through and just stand there, it's not a score. You have to place the ball down, and then it's considered a six-point score or try, at which point you do have a similar kind of free kick afterwards. But wherever the ball is placed down, that's where you kick from as far as the, the angle. So if you can run in and put the ball in the middle under the crossbars, you're much more better off with a kicker than if you go to the very angle because then you got to kick it from the corner and try to get it through. So a little strategy to where you place the ball. Right, right, right. So... If you had, if you had been given a choice, be a a rugby, be a, a, an all-star rugby player, mm -hmm. professional, mm -hmm. or an all-star football player, professional, which would you have taken? I'd probably still say football for the uh, notoriety of the of America and the, obviously much more uh, money in, involved in that. You get paid well, I think, as a football player. Yeah, yeah, the rugby yeah. United States is really more of a, you know. I don't know if it's a second-class sport, but uh, not as popular of a sport. So there's not as much of a of a notoriety around it. So, you're meanwhile you're the first and foremost, obviously the the uh, the uh, goal that you were is to get your chiropractic mm -hmm. degree. You got your doctor in chiropractic. Yep. Came back to Connecticut. Yes. And uh, did you did you what did you initially do? Uh, Start on your start out on your own. Mm -hmm. Get into with another uh, business uh, yeah. group. When or? I first was looking to move back, I was engaged at the time, and I knew I was going to move back to Connecticut and get married. So I was trying to find a job. I didn't want to go out on my own to begin with. I didn't have that as much confidence. That I knew what I was doing right out of school. I wanted to learn under somebody else's tutelage. So I was a very good student of, of sports, of, of 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 school. I had to learn from somebody that really can take me another way, and it always worked for me. So I figured I'd do that again. So I did find a job uh, for, for a doctor of chiropractic in Springfield, Massachusetts. He had two offices. So Michael O'Connor had a Springfield office and a Westfield office. So I ended up applying for him. I went through several stages of interview process, and he finally selected me to be the, the guy that worked for him. And I did that for a year and a half. I was living in Newington, commuting to Springfield, Mass, and Westfield, Mass. So I did that for a few years. Um, ultimately, did leave there to go work for Guy Carbone, who wanted me to come work for him at that time, who was my, you know, my childhood chiropractor, so I always wanted to do that. Worked there for a year. My daughter was born at the end of that year, at which point uh, Michael O'Connor offered me a job to come back with him as a partner. And I thought, wow, that's a great opportunity. It's a really tough decision to leave where I am, being local, being with a guy that I've always wanted to work for and always admired and really got me into the profession or I could be a partner, and I was only probably 26 years old at the time. So I said, ah, that's the opportunity for me. So I chose to do that. So I left Guy's office, went to uh, Springfield, and was a partner there. I was there for another four years, I think. 
during that time, I opened up my own office on, on, as a side business in Newington, just part-time. It was me and my mother and my wife at the time. That was our entire office. That was my business. So we worked probably six to eight hours a week was all I had outside of work in the other offices in Massachusetts to then see patients locally. Because even if my friends or my family, they want to get adjusted, they'd say, where are you? I'd say Springfield, Mass. And they were like, well, that's too far. So I opened this other small business on the side, and that's kind of how it started. Well, uh, from what I've, what I've uh, uh, investigated here, you now have, uh, from compared to what you started out mm -hmm. with uh, just a matter of a few years ago, really, mm -hmm. to where you are now, you have a very large facility. Mm -hmm. You have a staff of 24. Correct. Um, you, you obviously have the... Uh, I know. I know that you've got a very, very good reputation as being a practitioner, mm -hmm. a doctor of chiropractic. Mm -hmm. But there's also the business aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you've obviously been quite good at, at building the business. Mm -hmm. Which which one? Which one is a source of greater uh, pride or greater interest to you? It's a great question. I mean, I, I do think that. Um, I approach them both the same way. I feel that as the, the doctor of chiropractic to my patients, I, I give as much as I can of me. I have genuine care and compassion for the outcome of what's happening with their health and their concerns and their, their, their issues. So I look at it the same way with, with my staff. I mean, I, I always tell my staff, as we get busier and there's more money to go around, you'll have it as well. I'm not going to sit there and, and expect you to work harder than me and get a lot less money. I really try to be above the curve as far as what we pay for starting, we pay for um, incentive programs and such. So I think we really try to take care of our staff. You know, I'm sure you've, everyone said we try to teach it, treat it like family, but I really do consider my staff, my family. My, you know, we all work together. We all have the same mission in mind. Our goal is to help people get better, to influence our community in regards to healthcare, which is something that is in dire need, if you ask me. That's a wonderful attitude, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful attitude to have. Um, the uh, uh, are there any are there any local because um, I know I see a lot of uh, athletes mm -hmm. or people who look like they're athletes mm -hmm. you know athlete, going into your facility mm -hmm. are are there any local sports teams that you that you're kind of like their team yeah. chiropractor? Yeah, we work with a lot of sports teams from a high school level to even though we're really close to Central Connecticut State University of Proximity. So yeah. a lot of those athletes that come and see us. But um, I'm actually the uh, the official chiropractor for the Hartford Wolfpack, the AFL affiliate. The hockey team. Yeah, of the, of the Rangers. So we, I've been doing that. This is my 11th season doing that. And that's probably one of my, uh, my greatest accomplishments. I really feel that's a very, very um, important place for, for chiropractic and, and, and the, the team as well as the players really do well with it. I mean, whenever I go down there, it's like the, the, the lineup for it. They, everyone wants it. It's just really a nice feeling when it's hard where sometimes the general public doesn't understand what chiropractic is or what it can do, but yet the pro athletes, the, the, the guys that use their bodies at the highest level, they use it across the board. Every single pro team has chiropractic on staff, every NFL team, all the NHL teams. It's really nice to be part of a community that really works. I work with the, the medical doctors there, the orthopedists, the team athletic trainer is a great guy that refers back and forth with me. So I do really enjoy that avenue of, of what we do in chiropractic as the sports. Why part. do you suppose the Wolfpack, that's a pretty good organization mm -hmm. and they got some world class oh, athletes for sure. obviously. Yeah. Pro, this is professional hockey we're talking oh, yeah. about. Why did they? Why did they pick you? There's chiropractors all over the place. Sure. Well, was, why did they pick uh, Eric Devoto? It was an interview process. You know, I had to work with the team uh, trainer as well as their orthopedic and go back and forth. We had to do some hands-on. Some, I don't know if there was a quiz per se, but you know, kind of what's your philosophy on uh, on chiropractic and and how integrated can I be with these other uh, health professionals? And you know, once once you get in, it's still kind of a you know trial and error, see how you do. So I've been doing it now for, like say, 11 seasons, and it really it just got better and better with, once the trainer got to know me better, and you know, we, we have a real good back and forth relationship with, um, with treating injuries. So it's kind of nice to see that collaborative approach, which doesn't always happen, unfortunately, for the average person, let's say with a, a back or hip problem, they see three different doctors and they get three different opinions and they don't really work well together sometimes. And that's a frustrating thing for me in the general day-to-day -day practice that you don't see so much in the, the athletic world. A lot of the local high schools, mm -hmm. um, 
Newington High mm -hmm. and Wethersfield High mm -hmm. and, I mean, various other uh, municipalities, a lot of their high school athletes, mm -hmm. um, the men and the women, mm -hmm. uh, uh, are there's a stream of them going into your place yeah. all the time. We have a lot of that. And the, the only challenge when it comes to the high school athlete, obviously it's all parental consent and been parent involvement and all that, which is certainly not is fine. There's just not always that... Um, true understanding of what's happening, what their child may need. When you get to the collegiate level or the, the professional level, the, the, the athlete makes their own decisions and signs their own consent and pays their own bills or their team takes care of that. So Eric, who are your typical, or is there such a thing, who are your typical uh, clients or patients? That's a great question. Is there such a thing or is it so uh, variety? It, it, it's a great question. I would say the most that we see would be your average you know, middle-aged American adult. You know, you're going to see someone between 45 and 60. You'll see a lot of that. But we see children. We see the, the seniors on Medicare. We have the athletes. We have a little bit of everything. I mean, one thing we really enjoy, at least I personally enjoy, is the, the pregnant women and the children. It's just such a nice or rewarding feeling to really get some vitality and, and get these people to be number one more comfortable as they're delivering their child or soon to be, as well as the child after they're born to make sure that their spine is, is healthy, is developing right, that there is no ailments that can be spinal related. What are some of the issues uh, in terms of a pregnant woman, hmm. uh, what would be, why would a pregnant woman come to chiropractic and what can chiropractic do for, because I guess it's the, once the, as they uh, get bigger, the baby gets mm -hmm. bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. there's that weight and that's the, is that pressure on the back yeah. and all that yeah. stuff? And that's probably the simplest answer is that, that as the woman's stomach gets larger with the baby, a lot of the, the ligaments are getting looser to prepare for delivery, so the pelvis kind of opens up. So it does create pain. You get a lot of the generalized back pain, hip pain. Sciatica is very common, which is that nerve pressure down the leg. We even see um, women that have a lot of carpal tunnel, which is common when you're pregnant. So we do a lot of work with that as well. So it is keeping them comfortable, but also, it makes the, the nerve supply to the baby really better, prepares them for the delivery process. We address the muscles as well. We make sure everything is really prepared as best as it can be for that uh, delivery that's, uh, I'm sure you know, is very challenging for a lot of, uh, a lot of women. Well, yeah, I'll bet, I'll bet. So, uh, I hear that, uh, I have heard that you have a, um, is it true that the rumor I hear you, that you have a, a moose in your office? Is there, I do, is there, I do you have, a, have moose. a moose at your office? I have, a, I have a moose. Tell us about moose. Moose is my one-year-old uh, bull mastiff puppy. And he, he grew up in the office since he was born. We've had him since he was three months. And he's, he's there every single day that I'm there. And he just mills around, says hello to the patients. He'll walk in, give you a kiss on the cheek, smell your feet, and then he kind of moves on to the next room. But he's our little unofficial mascot. We have him on our Facebook page, and a lot of little kids especially love seeing moose come in. So it's, yeah. it's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. He's a big boy. He's a big boy. He's, he's going to get bigger, too. He's not quite fully grown. But how, how, many, how, many, how, how much? He's about 110 now. He'll be probably another 40 pounds or so. Another 40? Yeah, that's what they expect. So that must be, that's a big uh, uh, food. Yeah, he has food, money for food. Yeah, it is. But he doesn't eat as much as you may think. He's not a big food-driven guy. He eats only when he's hungry. So he's, he's, pretty, uh, he's pretty lean. He's a, he's a pretty big ball of muscle. Well, I'm sure that most of your time is w with your business. Now that you're older and a lot of your s sports, like all mm -hmm. of us, me too, uh, those sports are, are um, kind of thing of the past. Right. Do you st are you still... Do you still, uh, what, what physical activities do you still engage in? Well, I, my job is very physical. So just to keep in shape for that, I actually, we have, um, as part of the office, we actually have a, a, a gym. We have a full gym associated with it, which is a, a personal training facility. So we do a lot of rehab exercises for the patients, and I participate in that as well. So I'm there usually twice a week at lunchtime, just doing some of the stuff that keeps my back and hips strong and flexible so I can continue doing this job for hopefully years to come yeah right, right but yeah most right. of my sports now is just with my children i just watch my uh my daughter and my son play their sports you know which keeps me very busy outside of work i'll bet you mm -hmm. well you're still young you've got a long way to go but mm -hmm. as you look back down the road that you've traveled up to this point mm -hmm. eric um what would you say i mean there, there certainly is no shortage of of uh goals and accomplishments that you've had is there anything that stands out in your mind what, what would you say is your biggest uh your biggest um uh, accomplishment 
that you've... I mean, I'd say it's easy to say the, the growth of the business because it really has come a long way in a, in a decade or so. And I really think that the, the growth to me is the team that's done that and well as the influence we can have on the community. I think the bigger we get is only beneficial because we can serve more people and get more people involved in a uh, another way of getting healthier. Because as if you watch the news, you'll see that our healthcare situation is not wonderful in the United States right now. So I do like that we're able to handle a lot more people on a given day or given week. So that's an easy accomplishment that I think is wonderful. The other one though I really think is just seeing my two children thrive and be you know great with their academics as well as their sports. I mean I couldn't be prouder of, of, of watching them grow to where they're at this they're 13 and 11 and they're really getting independent and they're really doing well in school and I, I couldn't be prouder of, of, of who they've become. So again just prying in a little bit, getting a little bit nosy here, but what, uh, um, it, up to this point, what are some of the, you know, as we all have experiences, mm -hmm. um, if we take time to th think about them mm -hmm. and re reflect on those things, what are some of the, um, what are the, some of the most important things that you've learned about, what have, what have you learned about Eric D'Amato, what have mm -hmm. you learned about life in general? Yeah, I've learned a lot. And I, I would say the biggest thing when it comes to like just career perhaps or business in general is not to really strive to get to some end point, not to push it so much that you want to get to this next level. Because the next level is not necessarily any better. I really missed some of the, the journey to steal from your, your title of, of getting to this point. I mean, I look back, oh man, how did 16 years go by already? You know, and I know you hear that a lot of people about how fast it went, but I didn't necessarily always enjoy every day. And I know that to take care of patients is a blessing. It's, it's an honor to do that. And yet, you know, there's weeks where I just couldn't wait to get to the next week and do the next thing and go to that next level of, of growth and expansion and influence. And looking back, I would have liked to have enjoyed a little more of the steps along the way. Well, that's very, yeah, that's, that is a great insight. So that you've come to realize that, that to, 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 be aware of and be conscious of the process mm -hmm. and that keeps you instead of you having your mind on well this is what this is what i want to accomplish for next week or mm -hmm. for next year mm -hmm. and you're, you're thinking about the future mm -hmm. you're in the here and the now mm -hmm. and it sounds like that's a lesson that you've learned very much yeah very much i like to be present when i'm in the room with somebody now or even with family or with friends it's nice to be present not always distracted by again the social media and everything that's all out there taking us away from what we're supposed to be focusing on which is the the interaction that's in front of us okay and uh, very last question uh unfortunately this the the just like a great meal the worst part of a of a delicious meal is when it's over <laughs> and you gotta end it yeah uh, and and the same thing with this interview but um uh, what uh, what's the is there a single book a book that you can that you that you've read that you can share with us that you like? Wow, um, I did read one that I did like. There's a bunch, but I, I, I like the One Minute Millionaire. I thought that was a really good book. I don't know if you read that one, no. but it's really more of a story about success, but more relationships along the way towards success, and it really is about giving back more than it is you know taking in. So the more you okay. can generate for yourself, the more you have to give to others and grow and actually help the community and society. That was a pretty good one. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for sharing that with us. We're out of time. Okay. You've been wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very for much. for sharing your journey. Thank you guys for watching and uh, we'll, we'll continue to have good, uh, good uh, guests on sharing their journey. And until next time, uh, Jeff Grandy saying good night. Take care.